Welcome. Nice to see you. I've got good news and bad news. The good news is that tonight's going to be highly technical. Uh, the, did I say that was good news or bad news? Oh, okay, okay. Uh, the bad news is that it's the only one this semester. So we've, I know, I know. Part, this is good, this is good and this is bad. This is good in that we've picked like the most thorny subjects humanly possible. And so I get to be like, hey, here's what's going on, peace. And then you guys get to do whatever you need to do. <laughs> um, but just say a prayer, what that is, is because there's a bunch of travel to Europe going on and I'm finishing up one of my degree programs and working on a dissertation that deals with demonology, which will be really fun for later when you all start asking me questions about demons, which I'm sure you will now that I've said that. I'm kind of excited because no, all, all graduate students always want to talk about their dissertation, so I'm like helping fuel that. So just a heads up that tonight's it for this semester. We'll pick a probably an equally thorny subject for next semester because that just seems to be how y'all want things to go when you send me questions. I don't know what that topic's going to be yet, but just a heads up that enjoy this time. Whatever questions you may have, this is it for this semester. We're not going away. It's just this first semester. Okay? All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Hello and welcome back to Rosho Christi Community Nights. For those of you who are brand new, we here at RC and at the incredible invitation of our host church here, The Vineyard, have been producing real-time apologetics exercises on behalf of the public and for the edification of those in our midst who need to see voluntary vulnerability from folks claiming to be spiritual leaders on pertinent topics. And for many years now, we've been doing this. It is a very great privilege to have this opportunity and the opportunity to serve you all in this way as your friendly neighborhood apologist. I normally spend a great deal of time in prayer over these talks and as topics continue to pour in from you all on what we should cover, I find myself on my face now in my office regularly repeating, really Lord? Like my prayers have moved to laying prostrate in my office and begging him for help as your questions over the years have moved from clarifying theology to almost completely cultural apologetics, hence why our topics have been extremely heated in the past few years. If you would like to review any of these, they're up on the YouTube channel and, um, as we've been filming them for those of you who want to review later. So go ahead and check all these topics out if you haven't got a chance to recently. Remember that the live stream ones last year are under the live tab now and not in the general video tab. So last year's Sex, Drugs, and Rock and Roll series is cumulatively in the thousands of views. So apparently subjecting myself to the topics you've been asking for is, I assume, a good thing. So now we carry on with tonight's topic, transgenderism. Okay, just to be clear, I have colleagues who think I'm absolutely insane for even considering handling tonight's topic. And it is for this reason that, that I am doing it. The idea that there is any topic whatsoever that is off limits for Christians to discuss at any great depth is absurd. And it is a personal pet peeve of mine that we often give in to those beliefs. I detest neglecting content that is obviously needed. I also detest repeating what other people have to say. So we're delving into material I have yet to see anyone handle in my field. And I am telling you this because you're going to have a difficult time testing me tonight. I don't have anywhere to send you to quickly compare my talking points with others. So as usual, I'm citing my references as we go along, so at least you can double check that they exist. Past that point, you have eyes and you have functioning brains. You have Bibles and you have the years of time we have done this together to judge any underlying motivations you may worry I have or don't have contingent upon your previously held beliefs regarding tonight's content. And I am prepared to live with the consequences of my speech. So please direct any emails my way as no one up until this point knows what I'm going to say, except for me in the spirit. Which means you can't blame anyone but me if I get you steamed a bit. For context then, some history is needed to set the stage here for mutual understanding. The apologetics movement in the US really only garnered significant traction in the eyes of the general public in the last decade. It's an ancient church role, but for the most part, the role has been absorbed into the preacher's realm, if he was even willing to engage in that sort of thing at all. 
Past that, you could find hobby professors who would write on the subject like C.S. Lewis and John Lennox, but those were quite rare. Prior to this point, your only significant access to apologetics was a handful of traveling apologists or if you attended seminary. And even then, it was only probably one class, usually an elective if you were into that sort of thing. But now you can study apologetics exclusively and on a graduate level, if you so wish, and thus has been born a new wave of apologetic students all eager to make their cases on whatever topic floats their respective boats. The thing about this is that this massive upswing in concern over the neglected realm of the apologist was steeped in an extremely influential study done in 2005 by sociologists Christian Smith and Melinda Lundquist Denton called the National Study of Youth and Religion. In this study, 3,000 teenagers were interviewed across the country as to their theological beliefs, and the shared characteristics were isolated and then systematized into the following set of faith statements. Number one, a God exists who created and ordered the world and watches over human life on earth. Number two, God wants people to be good, nice, and fair to each other as taught in the Bible and by most world religions. Number three, the central goal of life is to be happy and to feel good about oneself. Number four, God does not need to be particularly involved in one's life except when God is needed to resolve a problem. And finally, good people go to heaven when they die. In effect, God will reward nice people for doing their best. When asked to what religion each person belonged, the majority answer was, I am a Christian. From this came widespread panic from the pulpits of American churches. How could a nation that was majority Christian have raised an entire generation of young people who would completely fail to not only represent what Christianity actually teaches, but who seemingly had no clue that what they were saying was so far from the gospel that their baptisms appeared to be premature at best and straight up fraudulent at worst? Yes, there is a God who created and ordered the world and watches over human life on earth. Yes, God wants people to be good, nice, and fair to each other, as taught in the Bible. The caveat of believing that this is even remotely similar to most other world religions is only a plausible belief if you never actually read any of the texts of alternative religions. That's the entire point of documenting the separation of Yahweh's expectations from his people and from the rest of mankind's religions. Yahweh is unlike the rest of the world's notion of God. The central goal of life is not at all to be happy, or to feel good about yourself, and it never has been. Happiness is shallow and fleeting. Feeling good about oneself is only appropriate if you are good, and you're not good. None of us are. What is supposed to elicit positive feelings is in the knowledge that Christ has come for you to save you in spite of your badness. He loves you. It's unfathomable, and yet it's pure joy he will always come for you, he will never forsake you, and there is nothing you can do to deserve it. The good feelings do not come because of something good inside of you that all you need to do is discover in yourself. The good feelings come on behalf of the author of them who has come to deliver you from your reality of imminent and deserved death. The central goal of life has never been about you or your feelings at all. The central goal of life is to love Yahweh and enjoy him forever. The result of that embodied belief isn't happiness, it's joy. You're free, emotionally, cognitively, physiologically, a completely different thing altogether. And given that this is the entire point of Christianity, the idea that God does not need to be particularly involved in one's life except in order to help solve problems is equally absurd. God is so concerned with the details of your life and your flourishing that he has marked your life with only a certain number of days. This world is a shadow lands of depression, strife, pain, and any and all iterations of the blight of human sin we're experiencing and actively authoring while we yet breathe. The mercy is that we aren't going to have to stay here permanently that the way in which we walk out the details of our life directly correlates to how we experience this awful place. Entrusting obedience to his guidance, resulting in sacrificial love and joy abundant until we're called home, or in constant angst, strife, grief, and hubris-driven rebellion 
as we try to suppress the reality of his lordship until we find ourselves in a place reserved for those who refuse to bend. Because goodness, whatever that means, is not the criteria by which we arrive in heaven. We arrive in heaven because our repentant souls shrank and cowered from the reality of our badness and the man on the middle cross stooped down and picked us up from our mire and washed us clean. And yet, in spite of all of this, here we were. The turn of the millennia and with a sudden need to give a name to this new American teenage religion, wearing a label that was wholly inaccurate. And so a new label was born, the infamous MTD religion. Moralistic, therapeutic deism. Morality is important for identifying what is good. Morality is relative, but so long as it kind of sounds like something that could be construed as nice, then you're good to go. Therapeutic because God's only role is to comfort you when you want him or you need something from him. And his primary concern is that your emotional state remain in whatever iteration of happiness that is convenient for you personally. And deism, because God is remote and disinterested in the details of your life. Carry on and you do you. If you want him, he's there. But if not, it's all good. So long as you're a nice person, he won't really care. Jesus, Buddha, whatever makes you feel at peace, go for it. So long as you don't do something mean, like offend or behave as though your iteration of the divine is exclusively correct. And since this is so, never proselytize. That would be inappropriate since everyone's personal deity is all that really matters when we're getting along and doing our own thing. The chief end of man is never harshing the mellow, as it were. And so the wild and sudden recognition of the realm of the apologists came charging into the forefront of the minds of American churches, and by 2015, Christianity Today was running entire magazine editions devoted to the field. I remember quite distinctly being told by my silver-haired elders in seminary that it appeared that this was the dawning of the age of the apologist, as I was five years into a seven-year study program at the time. The age of Christian consensus in America was over. Private life was robustly diverse. And the average Christian, no matter the age, recoiled in discomfort at being asked questions about their belief, while simultaneously Others began spending every last minute learning the answers to the questions that the original apologist had answered in the first apologetic age, a time 19 centuries ago that erupted in similar cultural circumstances to us now in the 21st century. And now we're here, a decade later. Apologetics is relatively well known. Formal apologists are graduating from several different seminaries across the country. Apologetics is being woven directly into television series, sermons, podcasts, and even merch at most major faith-based conferences. And here you're spending your Sunday evening listening to one of these formal apologists do a public lecture on an issue you wanted to hear clarified. Which brings us to the point of why you need this context to understand tonight's topic because it is the tradition in apologetics to always anticipate objections to whatever you're about to argue for. You're a terrible apologist if you don't. And the problem is that I think I have to back all the way up to the history of what I've just laid out in order to do that tonight. Because modern American apologetics has been predicated on responding primarily to moralistic therapeutic deism. As the underlying worldview, our audiences are holding themselves or having to deal with on the regular with others. And the fact is that what that has meant is that every good apologist has been browbeating for near 20 years that Yahweh is not a moralistically, therapeutically remote deity, which is true, kind of. It's too broad a rejection this far into a worldview debate, though. That's for initial response stuff, not for the folks who need help parsing out the intricacies of human dynamics and identities. Because in all of our browbeating against these three categories, we've accidentally implied that Yahweh isn't interested in being therapeutic at all. Or that if you're a serious apologist, the realm of emotion is functionless to forming coherent arguments and persuading those around us, asking for accounting of what we believe. But what good is dauntless zeal and consummate wisdom if there is a lack of understanding of the human side of life. Yahweh is regularly therapeutic throughout the scriptures. Comfort and emotional concern is a feature of his character. What good is an argument separated from ears, attached to a body, deafened by the emotions the argument claims are irrelevant? And if we are being honest, is not biblical orthodoxy separated from an emotion like compassion? 
the ugliest thing in the world? Francis Schaeffer believes so. If you're not a theology nerd, Schaeffer is one of the first Christian philosophers of the 20th century. He is also one of the greatest apologetic thinkers of the previous age. Schaefer gave us a metaphor for understanding how American culture has pathologized truth by separating it into two categories. He uses this metaphor to expose an error in both thinking and emoting. And I think when I show this to you, you'll begin to get a feel for where I'm going with all of this. You're getting a bit of seminary this evening, so sit tight, this is important. The metaphor is a two-story house. In the lower story, truth is defined only by what we can glean using our five senses the finite world of the empirical, the natural sciences, the cognitive things, scientific facts, the thinking man's preferences. In the upper story, truth is defined by what we perceive without cognition, the world of values, emotion, morality, the things that give life meaning and make life worth living, the feeling man's preferences, love, fear, mercy, grace, heartbreak, loneliness, memories, ideas, and beauty. The reason the house is broken into two levels is because this is what American culture has done when handling the topic of truth. Reality is that the entire house is supposed to remain an entire house, where elements of both cognition and non-cognitive essences complement and complete one another, where the full experience of reality is simultaneously discoverable by both brain and heart, and where this robust experience is the only way of keeping either brain or heart material from becoming pathological. Pathology is the study of disease. Continuing with the metaphor, this means that to place oneself only on one level of analysis, either the bottom level or the top level, is to engage in an experience that is at the end of the day, diseased. We need both in order for our cognition and our emotion to remain healthy. And Schaefer called this method methodological framework the middle path. The active meditation of his apologetic school being an awareness of which level of analysis was needed in the mind of the person asking their questions, as well as the active refusal of the apologist to camp out in their personal preferences for systematic analysis of an issue. That an apologist worth their salt knows that it's not appropriate to only ever use one of the levels. Both levels are needed for the issue at hand to be dealt with appropriately and in a way that is apologetically competent. And we know this, don't we? The apologists that only ever discuss a difficult or thorny problem from the bottom level of analysis can usually win an argument, but they rarely win any people who aren't already on their team. What they win is accolades for exposing their opponent's failed reason. The result is normally humiliation on some level for the opponent, and they regularly walk away further from Christ than when they began the debate. In effect, exclusively bottom level apologetic analysis may hold the line but it is rarely evangelistic in nature. It wins battles, but it loses the war. On the other hand, in the very rare event that you find an apologist camping out in the top half of the house, they are normally extremely pleasant to interact with, but become fairly feckless in any type of public argumentation. When you really need the brass tacks and some ability to move forward with a significant problem on a large scale, a scale like what we're about to discuss, like is it ethical to remove healthy tissue from an individual who cannot consent because their brain hasn't entered adulthood? These types of apologists come up short quite quickly. There's a reason that they're rare. Very few people are interested in listening to apologists unless it's in an arena setting like this. You're here for answers, not cuddles. Get it out and get it done. And so apologists like this, C.S. Lewis, for instance, are sought for introductory material to Christianity, but past that, not really at all and certainly not in the form of gritty debate where lives are on the line. It's evangelistic in its pleasantness, but even C.S. Lewis would tell you that he didn't arrive at being the C.S. Lewis we know and love without his friends, and one friend in particular, J.R.R. Tolkien, an apologist in his own right, browbeating him with his own inconsistent thoughts regarding the nature of myth and archetypes. I'd like to suggest to you this evening that given the history of apologetics and the current American cultural norm to split up our analysis of truth based upon our own personal preferences for dealing with it, that we move away from our personal preferences at all and move instead into an era where what drives our analysis is what the person in front of us needs instead of what we feel the most comfortable with or favor ourselves to move the preferential treatment of material off of us as the objects of concern 
and onto the preferences of the person in front of us, meaning that we get really used to jumping into whichever level of analysis we do not like, so that we're prepared with positions that are accurate, as well as dispositions that are accurate. On top of this, what this means is that, practically speaking, there will be multiple ways to answer a question sometimes. Two ways of responding, one on the top level and one on the bottom level. In effect, a simultaneous way of answering one issue contingent upon the needs of the person asking the question. And I would like to suggest to you, in order to illustrate what I'm getting at here, that the Lord himself modeled this in the 11th chapter of John's Gospel. Turn in your Bibles with me for a moment and let me show this to you. This won't take but a moment. Look at this detail in a story most of us have heard a thousand times, the raising of Lazarus. If you are unfamiliar, let me set the stage for you. It's winter, and Jesus has just attended the Feast of Dedication and almost been stoned again by the Pharisees in Solomon's portico. The Feast of Dedication is Hanukkah, by the way, which means the setting you should be imagining is a very cold winter with snow on the ground. Yes, it does snow in Jerusalem. Christmas time there is very similar to ours. Jesus has been sent a message that his good friend is gravely ill. This friend is the brother of Mary and Martha, Jesus' disciples. They have been separated up until this point and are asking Jesus to return to them since they are only a couple of miles away in a township called Bethany. By the time Jesus is finished ministering to the people who have come to him for healing, Lazarus has died and has been interred long enough that the putrefaction process has well set in for his body. Jesus arrives at their home and at the location of the tomb to find both women distraught for obvious reasons. I'm going to pick up the story here at verse 17 in my New English translation. For those of you who are following along online, chapter 11, verse 17 and following of John's gospel. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had been in the tomb four days already. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, so many of the Jewish people of the region had come to Martha and Mary to console them over the loss of their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary was sitting in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will grant you. Jesus replied, your brother will come back to life again. Then Martha said, I know that he will come back to life again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even if he dies. And the one who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She replied, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God who comes into the world. And when she had said this, Martha went and called her sister Mary, saying privately, the teacher is here and he's asking for you. So when Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still in the place where Martha had come out to meet him. Then the people who were with Mary in the house, consoling her, saw her get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the people who had come with her weeping, he was intensely moved in spirit and greatly distressed. He asked, where have you laid him? They replied, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. Thus the people who had come to mourn said, look how much he loved him. But some of them said, this is the man who caused the blind man to see. Couldn't he have done something to keep Lazarus from dying? Yes. This man, Jesus, absolutely could have stopped Lazarus from dying. And if you continue to read, you find out that the entire experience of Lazarus, even to the point of death, was an incident of miraculous mercy on a multitude of levels. Not only does this incident demonstrate yet again that Jesus really is who he claims to be, Yahweh incarnate, but it also begins Lazarus' change in occupation from petty thief into disciple of Christ and the first patriarch of Crete giving those of us going through our own trials a measure of perspective and proportion in the reminder that even unto the point of death, what we experience in this broken world both, both proves Christ and improves us, even if we don't yet see that context in the same way Lazarus did until he emerged from the tomb. But that talks for another night. The reason I bring this to your attention now is because of the way Christ responds to Martha and Mary. Both raise the exact same 
qualitative objection. How could you have let this happen, Lord? Fundamentally, they ask of Christ exactly the same objection every honest Christian must contend with at some point in their lives. How could a good Lord have allowed this horrible thing to occur? And Jesus responds to each woman in the manner in which their disposition required. Martha needed a bottom level analysis. She needed reason, proof, context, fact. Martha receives the verbal explanation for what is occurring and she receives the preference that is noteworthy regarding her character. She's regularly heady throughout the gospel accounts and fairly stoic in disposition. And Jesus obliges her. But for Mary, the woman who had previously responded to the deep and profound knowledge of the imminence of Christ's impending death with the pouring out of her most expensive perfume on his feet and the consequent washing of them with her own tears and drying with her hair, the deeply emotive woman, he responds to exactly the same question from her with simply weeping. There is no logical proof, no reminder of the theological eloquence he has just gifted Martha with, and there's no stoic debate over the nature of the problem of evil. There is only the appropriate reaction to the problem of evil from a value and heart-oriented perspective. He wept with her. Same exact question. Two different answers on two separate levels of analysis contingent upon the questioner's needs. I would like to suggest to you this evening that we do both, that Christians are to reflect the character of Christ here on the painful subjects in contemporary culture. We provide positions that are logically consistent. We provide these positions, the emotionally appropriate dispositions of a people who are intimately acquainted with the emotions that are being discussed. It's both simultaneously and not contingent upon our own preferences, but rather upon the preferences of the person to whom we are speaking. And now that we are on the same page, we begin the peculiarly specific discussion of transgenderism. This topic is far from new, and I need you to soak this in for a moment because our young people dealing with this topic are under the impression that it is new, and it is very much not. We need to study our history here for their sake. For our context, we are going to begin with the concept of tomb-tomb in rabbinical Judaism. Designations regarding sexuality and its binary nature or lack thereof, dependent upon which rabbi you're currently following on Twitter, falls on a spectrum of analysis tracking the biological development of a human being. In Judaism, there are two sources for understanding theology. The written Torah, meaning what you and I know of the first five books of the Old Testament, as well as the oral Torah, or the traditions of the Jews and the rulings of spiritual leaders following the written Torah when dealing with complicated practical theology meaning documentation on how the hundreds of Mosaic laws were actually fleshed out on the ground by Moses and every leader after Moses' death. Up until 70 AD, when the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed, there was always a central location upon which rulings and applications could be made. This was called the Great Sanhedrin. You may remember that this court was where Jesus was brought to be tried for purported blasphemy before his crucifixion. After the temple was destroyed, there was now nowhere to go in order to receive the oral Torah, and so it was written down. And this is called the Talmud. The Talmud is composed of two sections, the Mishnah, which are the rulings, and the Gemara, which are the commentaries on the rulings. The Talmud is vast and full of really interesting cases and applications and comments, including, but not limited to, discussions regarding developmental sexual biology where differing categories of atypical gender expression development are fleshed out. There are six categories along a spectrum with female on one side and male on the other. In between those poles are the categories of Ailoni, a female whose secondary sex characteristics do not develop, an androgynu, someone with both sex characteristics, and a saris, a male whose secondary sex characteristics do not develop. On top of this, there's a final category, tomb tomb, the category of unknown sex characteristics as they have been hidden or covered. The tomb tomb designation is important because in order to reveal the appropriate biological category for the individual, surgery is required. Meaning that for what appears to be the history of Judeo-Christian thought, categories of analysis that look very similar to discussions of topics like androgyny, intersex, and transgenderism have been around from its inception. Most notably, and I want you to focus for a moment on the implications of this, 
the first halakhic documented individuals in the category of tomb tomb, a category apparently referenced hundreds of times in the Talmud, were Abraham and Sarah. The speculation goes that this is what explains Abraham and Sarah's context for their dispositions toward God's promise to them. And the necessary conclusions, if this context is accurate, that aid us in our assessment of them. Before they were Abraham and Sarah, they were Abram and Sarai, citizens of Ur, the capital city of the most venerated deity in the whole of Mesopotamia, the goddess Inanna, the goddess most famous for her contradictory abilities. In particular, her ability to change the gender of her worshipers at will. Lines 115 through 131 of the Sumerian poetry of Enhejuana, Inanna's high priestess in the 23rd century BC, which is the time of Abram and Sarai, reads thusly, to destroy, to create, to tear out, to establish are yours, Inanna. To turn a man into a woman and a woman into a man are yours, Inanna. And indeed they were in the eyes of her followers. A quick Google search will give you a great deal of reading regarding the practices of her temple attendance. You will see every form of gender blending available and readily speculated upon, even to the point of documenting that ritual songs of hers were subdivided by biological sex and that part of the transformation process between the two is in the documented phenomenon of the gala who were male cult worshipers and priests taking on female names and changing their voices to sing in the M.A. Sal dialect, which was reserved for women. The point is, it is out of this context that according to the Talmud, a tum-tum couple was called. Leave your home, Abram, the Ur of the Chaldees, and go to a place I have made for you. From here, all of the weirdness regarding the rapidity over which Abram abandons his wife in every major city on the way, to that end due to fear of being killed over her beauty, is clarified a bit via implication. Egypt, in the Old Kingdom, had three biological categories for sex differentiation, as far as we know. There's male, female, and a eunuch. Past that point, the category of eunuch was differentiated into eunuchs who were made that way through surgery, otherwise known as cut eunuchs, and born eunuchs who did not develop typically and were therefore disinterested in women. There is evidence that pharaohs of this time preferred to keep their court officials eunuchs of either category as it meant a greater control over the sexual partners of the women of the court and no competition for the pharaoh himself. For example, our oldest English Bibles, the Dewey Ray's English translation and the Geneva Bible, preserve in their translations this tradition when they document that Potiphar the famous court official in Joseph's story, only a few chapters after Abram's, is a eunuch in the Saris category. And what is more is that given the details preserved in Genesis about him, the fact that he is a eunuch in the Saris category and married means that it was probably only a legal marriage and a very unsatisfying one at that for Potiphar's wife, which means the incident of predatory lust over Joseph by her was way more involved than just an OG episode of Desperate Housewives. And it also helps explain Potiphar's willingness to believe her obvious lies that result in Joseph's imprisonment. But I digress, back to Abraham and Sarai. By the time they get to their destination, we have an extremely peculiar account that the covenant the Lord himself is about to cut with Abram involves actual cutting. And wouldn't you know it, it's genital surgery. So just in case you've ever sat there and asked yourself, why circumcision? I would like to suggest to you that it is for many levels of analysis as the Lord normally does. Metaphorically for his people in consequent generations, hygienically for the rest of human history, visually for the sake of the enemies of God, spiritually for the sake of spiritual discipline, discussions later, etc. But for Abram himself, he would not have questioned it at all. You'll notice he doesn't protest one bit and he has no problem protesting God. If you don't believe me, flip back to Genesis 18 to see what I mean. He's like, let's go. Because genital surgery for him would be what clarifies and gets him out of the category of tomb tomb. And pregnancy for Sarai would be what would get her out of that category as well. There is now no question as to their gender. They are male and female in spite of their atypical sexual development biologically. On top of this, 
the confirmation happens well into their old age. Pregnancy and Sarai's clarification was impossible without a miracle. She had already been through menopause. And so Yahweh handles that detail as well. The great physician knows what he's doing, it would seem. But what's more is that if we assume the implications of what I've just laid out are true, this means that in order for us to do our due diligence on that two-story house framework I've introduced, we need to camp out on something. What, we've, what we have in this iteration of the transgender discussion is a bottom-level analysis. We have objectively verifiable characteristics we can point to, a medically anomalous, completely separate, that are medically anomalous and completely separate from the emotions surrounding the discussion. Functionally speaking, since the halakhic sexual development categories are biological, this means that they correlate to our current clinical category of intersex. These are individuals who have verifiably indeterminate aspects to their biology, genetics, or both. Depending upon who you are speaking with and how up on the vocabulary being tossed about these days defining gender categories, which changes near daily. You will notice that when it comes to transgenderism discussions, there is a rapid and convenient conflation between speaking about the anomalies of intersex individuals and speaking about transgendered individuals who have no verifiably anomalous characteristics biologically at all. And I cannot help but point out how inappropriate this is on a cultural level. Intersex individuals ought to be assessed on an individual level and not conflated with transgender cases in general. They deal with what is often extreme marginalization along with complicated medical histories, cancers, and hormonal imbalances, amongst many others. The details of each case um, very much matter since sexual development takes time. Self-report in these cases is critical as they are the ones living in a body that is genuinely anomalous and one that may not be immediately evident to the rest of society visually and sometimes even to them. Which means, loved ones, that if you are a member of this particular human population, and if you sit there wondering if anyone understands you or the immensity of the emotions you feel on a daily basis, if you worry that if you speak that you will be immediately pinkwashed into politics you never wanted anything to do with, the answer is not only are you seen by Yahweh, but also he may have designed from all eternity that his people were to be descended through atypically sexually developed individuals just like you and that this design was a feature and not a flaw in the providential sense, which means you are a feature and not a flaw in the providential sense. Your privacy is yours and ought to remain that way, but if you are so inclined to speak about these things, it is to Yahweh's people that you ought to feel the safest and least judged by. I know that very often th this is not the case and I'll be addressing that for a moment at the end, but at least now, you have some apologetic material of your own to help curb some of these more poorly articulated talking points that are circulating in Christian circles. And at least now, perhaps, the Christ to whom we all need might be liberated enough in your mind to ignore any ignorance you've encountered and to get to know the Savior to whom you belong more intimately. And gosh, I hope so. On that note, we move on. Because if we've addressed the biologically derived part of the transgender discussion, then we have left to address the non-biologically derived part of the discussion. The phenomenon of desiring to present as the alternative gender without a biologically verifiable need to do so is also fairly well documented. What is new is the attempt by physicians to try and elicit the change through surgical means. What is also new is the openly manipulative way clinical research on this subject, something we are in desperate need of, is being purposely and coercively buried through social pressure. And what's worse, the way that some physicians have begun experimenting on children in order to facilitate advancing their own careers. More on that in a moment, but it is in this context that we find ourselves currently in the transgender discussion in this category, a landmine of contradictory and ill-fated pseudo-medical jargon all packaged into a minority group. A minority group experiencing genuine suffering that is being leveraged and paraded by maniacal psychophants desiring to experiment on our little ones under the guise of liberating the discriminated. What we're dealing with in this category is regularly mob cowardice blindly presenting itself as morally superior. And it's doing serious and permanent damage to the individuals in this category wearing the label transgender. Very serious damage. 
And in order to understand my strongly worded verbiage here, I need to take you back a few years in the history of medicine on this subject. In 2003, psychologist and professor at Northwestern University, Dr. J. Michael Bailey, published his now famous book, The Man Who Would Be Queen, The Science of Gender Bending and Transsexualism. In it, he outlines the evidence regarding transgenderism, that it is actually two categories of adults experiencing this phenomenon. Number one, an innate and extreme form of homosexuality, and number two, those who experience a fetish arousal pattern called autogynephilia. Don't get caught up on the vocabulary. I'm not going to take us into the weeds on this. You can read all about it later. The point is that since neither type were what the then transgender activists were promoting, they in turn concocted a smear campaign in order to hush the study. The entire controversy was reported by Alice Dreger, a historian and a bioethicist, herself an intersex advocate and activist documenting this as well as other cases of the harassment of psychologists studying the phenomenon in her book, Ali Leo's Middle Finger. It seemed that when faced with medical evidence that does not confirm the transgender advocacy agenda, they squash it before it reaches the masses. Fast forward to 2008, when Dr. Kenneth Zucker, International Authority on Gender Dysphoria in Adolescents and Children, and lead psychologist at Toronto's Center for Addiction and Mental Health, was chosen by the American Psychological Association Task Force on Gender Identity, Gender Variance, and Intersex Conditions to author the standards of care for individuals suffering under the disorder in the DSM-5. That's your normal diagnostic manual for physicians. As chairman of the APA's work group on sexual and gender identity disorders, Dr. Zucker authored the standards of care for transgender children and adolescents. The standard of care is referred to as watchful waiting, as he noticed that left to their own devices and under therapeutic counseling for patients experiencing both this disorder along with the multitude of other disorders that normally come alongside it, would grow out of the disorder over time. But as with the previous case, such therapies were seen as attempts by Zucker and his team as conversion therapy by trans activists, even though the clients did not experience anything that converted them at all. And that demonstrated that what we may be seeing in children and adolescents with regard to the phenomenon may be very different than that which is experienced in adults. You see, the trans advocacy agenda is to unilaterally espouse that once a child acts or plays in a way that suggests they might be transgendered, that this is a permanent state regardless of their age. And so clients of Zucker began their smear campaign of his clinic in order to shut it down. And shut it down they did. The clinic closed in 2015 in spite of the fact that the Center for Addiction and Mental Health has come out publicly with an apology to Zucker and his team and all of the clients have retracted their false accusations. But still the clinic and the world's leading expert on the subject remain entrenched in obsolescence. And these cases are not out of the norm. K James Caspian at Bath Spa University in 2017 began documenting the cases of transgender patients who returned to their doctors for reverse gender reassignment, or what is known as detransitioning. These are the scores of patients who regret or phase out of their transgendered identity and wish to return to what they were before they transitioned. His proposal was accepted until the university considered the backlash they might receive from the trans community, to which the ethics subcommittee at Bath Spa admitted, attacks on social media may not be confined to the researcher but may involve the university. Yet again, transgender activist outcry becomes the driving force for hushing medical research. Even more startling, in 2019, Lisa Lippman of Brown University noticed a predominance of what she outlines as rapid onset gender dysphoria in adolescents who experience sexual trauma or bullying and who find solace in binge watching transition stories on YouTube. She demonstrated that these cases appear to be manufactured and a form of gender dysphoria by way of social contagion. Her work has been so buried that it takes significant work simply to be able to read it. Are you getting the picture here? You see, the problem with a transgender diagnosis is that it is a self-diagnosis. There is no objective criteria to prove or disprove that someone is transgender. We don't have enough studies to know what is going on yet for certain in these cases. And every time an actual study is performed for the purpose of seeing what is going on, when it is a study that might not sit well with the current advocacy groups, it's silenced. 
The only thing medical professionals have to go off of is the patient's word, which is why they're referred to gender clinics elsewhere. Yet very damaging and permanent hormone therapy is the modus operandi for these gender clinics. And in increasing cases like Dr. Joanna Olson Kennedy's study of gender nonconforming children, we're watching children as young as eight years old being given hormone blockers to halt puberty, and girls as young as 13 being given radical mastectomies for research purposes. These are irreversible procedures on children where there is literally no way to confirm medically that these children are what they are self-reporting, and at an age when they are still building snowmen and believing in the tooth fairy. How could a child this age possibly be able to consent to and understand the drastic level of consequences to such a decision? Or understand the burdens of these treatments? And on top of all of this, why is it that the American Psychological Association's therapy protocols for this are being completely ignored? Especially when the evidence we do have points to a conclusion that says when it comes to this category of transgenderism, that surgical and hormonal interventions are potentially abusive to the mental health of the adult who should be expected to mature out of it and wonder why medical professionals affirmed a non-medical professional's self-diagnosis with zero diagnostic criteria to objectively verify it. That's not science, and it certainly isn't medicine. The point is to do no harm to the patient. So why aren't they being referred to the clinicians that have a care protocol, protocol that does that? And questions of this nature on this topic are near limitless because of this. Do we move our assessment out of the realm of the scientific or bottom level analysis and into a top level perhaps to solve it? It seems to me that this is already happening amongst advocacy groups, but unfortunately no, this change of analysis from science to values really does very little to help here since one of the most obvious problems with some of these talking points is the highly concerning problem of treating gender as binary under their own framework. The value undergirding this particular discussion is that if a child presents as a tomboy, that this means she is actually a boy's identity in a girl's body, and therefore the way forward is to transition her body to match her identity. Which begs the question, how do you know that she isn't instead a young lesbian or even more emphatically, how do you know that she isn't any of the other genders available to identify with? Why is the world being construed as needing to be in a male or female category at all for hormone shifts and surgeries? Isn't the point of this worldview to dispense with binary male and female in the first place? And if genitalia doesn't determine gender, then neither would removing it. Is gender biologically determined or not? We can't say it's all socially constructed in one breath, but that it's also biologically determined in the other. Are you following how many things need to be nailed down from both bottom and top levels of analysis before we proceed in this discussion? Which I suspect is why that as of February of last year, the summary recommendations in the nations with the longest histories of transgender surgeries, Holland, Sweden, Finland, Norway, and the UK, all agreed that on the basis of the evidence that the category of transgenderism we are describing here be kept as a diagnosis of gender dysphoria or gender non-congruence, and that all hormonal and surgical interventions on minors be illegal and that presentation of gender dysphoric symptoms in children and adolescents be referred to psychiatric care and gender exploratory psychotherapy instead. But you didn't hear anything about that particular headline, did you? So what now? What do we do with all of this information? How does one proceed when a problem is thorny and complicated and admittedly we're far from a clear picture or the luxury of many decades of human analysis to fall back on? We go back to the start of this talk and we assess ourselves. To whom are we speaking? And to what end are they needing an answer? Are we speaking to auditoriums of people who need a bottom level empirical analysis? Are we speaking to a cohort of peers who already understand that level of analysis and are in need of the reminder of the dangers of an echo chamber and that the thorny subject involves deeply intimate and profoundly painful emotions? Are we speaking to an individual who needs to be reasoned with or an individual who needs to be wept with? Perhaps it's a bit of both. 
But what we desperately want to avoid is the pitfall of having only conversations in the categories we personally prefer. You know the ones. All humans have them. They're the ones you practice in your head to whatever audience is the most annoying to you. Practicing speeches that may or may not ever come. They're the condescending tropes you rehearse that if we were being honest, carry with them a disposition that communicates, I think the people who are seeking nuance where I see none are idiots, and I'm going to make sure they know it through the tone of my voice. They're the dismissive slogans delivered with the refusal to even entertain the thought that perhaps you're missing pertinent information, that if we were to being honest, carry with them a disposition that communicates the belief that everyone looking for something genuinely objective on such a difficult subject is beneath you. What we do instead is to actively seek to mitigate creeping sin in ourselves first before we react, lest we give our great enemy exactly what he wants, which is to keep us believing that each other is the enemy instead of him. We do not lie. We do not abuse. We study the scriptures. They were designed expressly for these moments. The entire point of Yahweh giving us a map of how to determine our steps is so that we know what to do when everything gets dark and we don't have all of the answers. The protocol does not change. When what we do when we do not know what else to do, we look at each other, we weep over the state of things, and then we take them to the foot of the cross and we focus on Christ. Because if we fail to preach the gospel to ourselves on this subject, we will fall into the pathological ends of either category of analysis, trusting ourselves and trusting our experiences and slowly corroding into an echo chamber unto ourselves. On the bottom level analysis, we will result in a horrible kind of arrogance believing we understand everything. And on the top level of analysis, abject despair, believing there is nothing available to understand. And if we are not careful, those diseased dispositions will be precisely what the enemy wants anyway, which is on one hand to destroy the church from inside through smugness, while on the other hand giving everyone outside of Christ a perfectly good reason to reject his message with glibness. And I want you to meditate on what I mean by this since I only have your attention for a few more minutes. And I suspect I'm actually currently preaching to the choir. So I'm going to illustrate what I mean with the most personal example I can before we open up for Q&A so that you can take it with you to explain to those in our community what you heard about tonight and the immediate takeaway. I want to elicit in your spirits the stories I am hearing from individuals who identify as transgender in this part of the Bible Belt go something like this. I tried Christianity, but they wouldn't let me in. I couldn't get away from the staring and constant descent into my personal life and private medical history to be able to even feel comfortable entering a sanctuary. I was judged immediately upon entering because I did not look the part, and I'm not really interested in spending time in a place I clearly do not fit in. I do not think I will ever look like a Christian or feel like one, so what is the point? Now, I fancy myself a spiritual leader in our community and I have the audacity to regularly wear a microphone and tell you what I think. Since this is the case, I have become relatively well known in our community for better or for worse. Prior to my assignment here, I had a small following as well due to my work with cult psychology and campus ministry duties elsewhere. Over the course of my career, what has amassed around me is a parish of roughly a dozen churches in East Tennessee alone, innumerable congregants across the entire spectrum of theological diversity, hundreds of college students, scores of professors and peers, as well as an international presence in both of my fields to the point of regular speaking engagements across the country and outside of it. On top of this, my social media presence is enough to recently have been offered an avenue to monetize which means every time I post something, over 6,000 alternative accounts have requested to see it. The point being, there are an awful lot of people who have access to seeing me daily, and the vast majority of them would report that they consider themselves Christians. Yet, over the course of the last few years, all of these thousands of Christians, in multiple iterations of belief across multiple continents, watched as I went from 165 pounds to 250 pounds over the course of roughly 24 months. And never once was I approached with the comment, hey Anna, thank you so much for coming into our church to worship and maybe sharing a message with us. 
but I can see that the most pressing issue we need to discuss is you appear to be living in an openly gluttonous relationship with food. And for all intents and purposes, that's exactly what it looked like I might be doing, at least visually. It wasn't, but no one knew that until recently. I didn't even know. Turns out I have a congenital endocrine disease that was exacerbated by pregnancy and I needed medication because I was dying. But I thought that what I was experiencing was what everyone warned me about happening in your 30s. In my mind, I was just getting older and that meant I just needed to run harder and obsess about the litany of conflicting emotions I was having on a near daily basis, watching my bathroom scale climb. On top of this, one of the side effects of the disease is random nausea that correlates to my blood sugar tanking, which for my particular problem could be at literally any time if I don't time my meds appropriately, which means for every day that I see human beings, which is every day, my personal prayer is, please, Lord, keep my blood sugar from tanking until I'm in the car by myself so that I don't have to suddenly begin gagging uncontrollably in public. Do I want to discuss all this medical history when I walk into a church in order to explain why they shouldn't immediately judge me as gluttonous? No, I don't. Because it's a complicated balance of my bloodstream and hormones, and it's no one's business. I would just like to worship with my family, please. The point being that at first glance, if we applied what transgender individuals are reporting they are experiencing in churches, which is visual judgment of suspected potential sinfulness, then why was it not applied to me for the same? Why was my suspected sin quietly treated as irrelevant, but theirs wasn't? How many intersex individuals have been judged by appearances when there was absolutely no potential sin there at all? How many of our adolescents are showing up needing the therapy of hearing a gospel that doesn't care about the cut or color of their hair as they grapple with the reality of distortion in their own minds in the form of gender dysphoria? And why in the world are we treating people that we don't even know are Christians or not yet as though they have to look the part or pass some sort of unspoken dress code before they're allowed to feel at home? And even more alarmingly, are we beginning to believe the lie that our local church culture determines which sins are worth mentioning and which sins are not? Has gluttony become a respectable sin in America? Y'all, we have to help our people knock this stuff off when we see it. To say I'm concerned here is an understatement. I don't have all of the answers here. I think you could tell. But I do know this, and I invite you into this headspace with me, since I'm not certain we're gonna have a whole lot of answers rapidly here either. And since Francis Schaeffer has gone home to be with the Lord, we're gonna hear from him for a second. We'll bring back an old apologetics mantra I haven't heard in a while. Christianity is a hopeless task unless our doctrine is true to the Bible. Our apologetics is true to our doctrine, and our compassion is true to our apologetics. May this be true of us here at the beginning of the church age of the third millennium. May what our children inherit from us be positions that are biblical. May they inherit from us dispositions that are biblical too. And with that, we'll open up for any questions you may have. There are mics up front. If you're scared, you can jump on the YouTube channel and put your question in online. Hey. Hello. Hi, Lauren. Glad I was able to make it. I am too. It was a very interesting presentation and I appreciated it. Cool. So I found what you described with the bottom level and top level of argumentation or perhaps communication to resonate with my experience. And I'm very much someone who tends to default to the bottom level. Mm -hmm normally. Me too. <laughs> the thing is, when trying to communicate with someone who disagrees on the you know, transgender or more broadly LGBTQ issues, that person, if they need more of a top level uh, style of communication, what does weeping with a person in that type of situation look like in a way that 
doesn't compromise one's principles on you know, biblical issues of what sexuality looks like, while at the same time showing compassion for that person's feelings and perspective on the issue. Find out whether or not they claim to be a Christian and whether or not that label is accurate first. Because if what they need is to meet the great physician, then we have no business talking to them about sin yet any way they wouldn't understand it. Come meet Christ. Okay, now that we know who Christ is and you've been baptized and you fully understand what's going on and the sanctification process is beginning and you have the Holy Spirit and all the holiness factor of being a Christian is, is self-evidently present in their life, that bottom level analysis should be much easier. In the meantime, if you don't understand what's going on, we say out loud, I don't, I, I don't have any metric for which to understand, but I can see you're in pain and I wanna get you what I can. So we just acknowledge our inadequacy openly so they know that we're not condescending. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Nobody's set a trash can on fire yet. I'm proud of y'all. This is why I do this here. Yes. I don't play with matches, so you're good. <laughs> um, my name's Corey Mounts. It's nice to meet you. Hello. Um, just curious about what your interactions with the transgender community have been like. Uh, fairly robust. So the beginning of my career was in the largest LGBT community in the world at the time. Um, it was Gainesville, Florida. This is back in the early 2000s. We were the first people to elect an openly gay mayor. So it was exclusively LGBT for the time that I was in, um, the beginning of my undergraduate career in religion and as a campus minister for the Lutherans. Um, so significant. Since then, I've had the privilege of working through therapies with several um, individuals who identify as transgender. And I'd say that's, that's about, is, is that, does that answer your question? Okay, cool. I'm not sure if you wanted me to keep going. I can keep going if I need to. Really? I did that good of a job. Just kidding. <laughs> I don't believe you. I don't believe you. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I have a question. Um, uh, the pronoun thing that's going really yes. strong right now. Okay. Um, where does that fall into this? It's a matter of conscience, right? So, okay, here's that. Here's that. It's a perfect illustration of top level and bottom level analysis. Are you speaking to an auditorium of people debating whether or not it's appropriate to have the government compel your speech to make it illegal for you to not acknowledge and use the pronouns you're being asked to use? Totally different analysis point than someone in front of you who you work with, you find out they're non-binary, their pronouns are they, them, and it's just in passing. Now it's a matter of conscience for you but that is a, that's a completely different level of analysis. I don't know how to answer that question because it's contingent on the disposition of the person asking you to say they, them. I know in some cases I have said they, them, like when I'm giving the gospel. Um, my cousin, I just visited in Arkansas, um, their daughter had to write a paper for college. Yeah. And the paper was rejected because she used the pronouns she and her. And the professor said that she would fail if she did not correct the pro, pro, uh, pronouns because she really didn't know for sure what that person identified as. Now, she didn't change them. Good for her. But that's kind of what I, I you know, I don't have a child in school, so I don't know what yeah. high schools, elementary schools are facing. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, because I, that, I can't imagine. This happened at UT, because if you remember, UT was the ones that came up with all the Z and Zer. We made the news, it was a really big deal. Um, totally different framework, because there the object of concern is a paper and a professor trying to compel speech, right? So I, I'm very proud of her. If she were one of my students, I would have said, well done, and if you need my lawyer, I can make that happen. Uh, yeah, because that's what, that's what we do with all of our students, yeah. Uh, Totally different than, let's say, somebody else was coming up and, I don't know, I'm trying to make up a, 
a situation. You've got an individual writing a paper analysis of some physician or something, and they are non-binary, so it's they, them pronouns. Um, and they come to the person who wrote the paper and said, would you please change the pronouns? Now we've got an issue of, okay, I'm talking to the person who's asking me. The object of concern is a human being. We would need to analyze the state that the person's in. But at the end of the day, if you don't have time to do all of this, it is a matter of conscience. Say a prayer, listen to the Holy Spirit, and go. Because I don't have a general answer for all of these at all, because the details actually matter. And where your disposition is spiritually matters too. Just be mindful of how that's going to be received. Right? I see a lot of like everybody panic, right? Somebody comes in, and somebody comes in and they're non-binary, and like the entire department is like, <gasps> what do we do? What do we what do we, do we all protest? Like, no, you don't have to protest. Have a conversation with the person. They're a person. They probably also don't want to concern themselves with it too much. They probably just want to get their job done. Um, at least that's been my experience. It's it's rare for me to, to see real big advocates that stay in a job long. Because they normally can't because they're doing advocacy all the time. <laughs> um, so I don't know the answer. What I do know is that you are free as Christians to do whichever one you are prompted to do, okay? Because sometimes it's in care for the other person. Other times it's because your spirit is like, nope, I can't, I'm supposed to not do this. I'm so, I, I can't tell you what the spirit's going to tell you. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I think you just answered my question. Oh, okay. Okay, because if I don't want to call you, if I want to call you he or she, yeah, okay, am I supposed to feel bad if you're offended because I call you a he or she? It depends. I don't know. Like, it, no, you don't have you don't have to do that. You don't have to feel badly. But let's say we're we're a, a personality that's rather abrupt. Normally, our disposition is pretty. You know, we're in your face like an apologist, right? Maybe a little bit of Asperger's in there. Um, and you, you hear he or she and you're immediately triggered and you're over there going, or you hear, you say he or she and they're, they're claiming it's a she and actually they're a he, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And you go up to them and you're like, he, him, you know that what I'm talking about happens all the time. Okay. Stop it. If you call yourself a Christian, knock that crap off immediately. Okay. If you're not a Christian, keep it up. Okay. <laughs> but if you don't know, if you don't know if they're, not a he or a she. And it's just roll with it. If you don't know, it's really none of our business. Just okay. like our medical history is not anybody else's business. So then if they go, whoa, yeah. don't call me that, da, 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 then am I supposed, I'm, I'm going to be okay with it. How am I supposed you can, you are free to be okay with that. If you're not okay with it, then we can, we can delve into more details about why, what's going on. Or do you know? Do you actually know this person? Are you deeply uncomfortable for some reason? And okay. in which case, you can avoid using pronouns entirely and just use their name. Okay. Yeah. The okay. point is, you're free. We just want to stop with the the ugh. like. Don't do that. Stop doing that, please. Please. Okay. Hello. Hi, Amanda. Thank you for the speech. Yeah. Um, I have a tough question for you, or at least it's of tough course, for me. Of so. course you do. No, it's okay. <laughs> yes. Um, so I hear the argument in, in favor of affirming someone's gender, and it goes something along the lines of, would you rather have a dead daughter or a living son? Because if you don't affirm them, they're going to kill themselves, and that's going to be your fault, so you should just you know, do what makes them feel comfortable. So I'm wondering what yes. your response is to that. Yes. Um, blackmail via suicide. That's what that is. I'm going to control you with a threat so that I'm going to end my life. That one is extremely hard because it's normally used in, this is something that's taught on YouTube. The young people can learn how to do this and what to leverage for to get the right medications. So that's, you need to know that out there. Um, you know your kid. And if it's the case that they are going to be suicidal in that sense, then all you have to do is say, honey, I love you to pieces. Let's go ahead and take you to the hospital then. Because half the time, what you're hearing is something that's rehearsed as opposed to something that's real. It doesn't matter if it's rehearsed. You have to take it seriously every time. So if we're to the point where a kiddo is threatening that they're suicidal over this issue, the issue is not that we go ahead and start castrating them chemically, because that would be abuse. It's to go, okay, well then we're gonna go ahead and take you to the hospital where I know you won't be able to do that. And then we'll assess from there, okay? 
Yeah, and then, yeah, I think that's a great response. And then for, like, usually it's not the, the potentially suicidal child who's making the argument. It's like, yeah, the college professor or, like, the adults who are, asked, who are telling people that's why you need to affirm them. So would you say that's the same response as, like, we would give to the child than we would give to, like, the people who are just saying that? I feel like it's kind yeah, of the equivalent it, to, like... Well, it's a non-starter. Here's why it's a non-starter. Suicide rates are higher after you transition. You are literally mitigating the likelihood of suicide by not permitting them to do hormone replacement therapy. And we have the numbers now. That's why Finland and Sweden did what they did. It's astronomically higher once you transition. It is famously so. So there, there's your, yeah, there's your Thank rebuttal. You. And I love to get those from you. Yeah, okay, no problem, no <laughs> Thank problem. Thank you. Yes. I'll have a quick statement and then a <clears throat> question. I'm sorry about my voice. No problem. Hi, Dr. Um, Bean. I'm sure you're aware of this, but earlier, Earlier this year, the state legislature uh, did pass a law against uh, gender-affirming medical care. I have heard that. that. I did not yes. confirm it. Brilliant. So the law passed, it and did. it's not being it's not being taken to the Supreme and, Court or and anything. Therapy ha therapies have been stopped. Brilliant. This year. Brilliant. Um, the question you mentioned a very pertinent term. Um, social contagion, yes. would you care to expand on that a little? Social contagion. This is the phenomenon that you see in the form in, in a, I see you back there, thank you. Um, like when everybody has the exact same meme all of a sudden, and they're all using it. You know what I'm talking about when you're on social media and the same meme goes through? That's kind of like a social contagion. Social contagion is something that so rapidly spreads through the population, a belief or a practice, something that is a, an idea or a talking point that is just suddenly there, um, and there's almost no time to respond to it in any real deep analysis. It's just suddenly a truth culturally, and you're like, where the heck did this come from, right? Um, hashtags can be a, a minor form of social contagion, these like slogany things. But in this particular case, the social contagion was the sudden the sudden rise of uploading videos tracking your transition, and it was getting clicks, and people were getting views, and that was becoming popular, and so everybody started doing it simultaneously because obviously there was a lot of gain. And so suddenly you have thousands of videos of people playing with transition, some of them fake, some of them real, some of them just to get clicks. Nobody knows because it's a video on YouTube. But your kids are on their phones in the room, moving through all this, and they don't have any protocols for who would determine what's real and what's not, and they're already a mess. Do you remember being a kid? It's awful. It's awful. You hate your body. All of us do. All of us do. We have all been through this in some iteration. Body dysmorphia, everywhere. It just happens to be that this one was something that caught on really, really quickly. And you get a lot of attention for it. That's social contagion. Is it okay if I go back there first? Because I, I, oh, yeah. I missed the hand initially. Della? Absolutely. So, is this thing on? Okay, fantastic. We have two questions. Um, first question, can you elaborate on the Abram and Sarai medical situation uh, that you mentioned earlier? Can I elaborate? Yeah. So they've got primary, so the Ilani and the Saris. So that's, Ilani is the, the female. She has XX chromosomes, um, and potentially, her, her, visually, she looks like she has the genitals of a female. That may or may not be true. We don't know exactly because we can't see inside. But secondary sex characteristics like breasts, like a voice that's um, higher, like um, no Adam's apple, things that are distinctly feminine never occur. Same thing, it's the, in the, the, the sorry category is the opposite. So we have male genitalia, or at least we, see, we can seed male genitalia. Um, but secondary male characteristics never turn up either. So their voice never drops, right? They don't have the Adam's apple. Um, they never develop any body hair, right? Um, things like that, does that help? Uh, we'll see. I and hope then, it does. I guess they can't tell me yet. <laughs> the second question is, if someone with another type of mental disorder asks you to affirm their disorder, should you? <laughs> Look, if you're not a clinician, you don't have to do anything at all. You can just be like, oh. Do you know what I mean? Like, you don't suddenly turn into a medical professional when somebody asks you to. You can just be like, not it. 
that's okay. Seriously, we do not have to have the answers to all these things. We can just be like, do you know what? Actually, I know somebody who you should talk to and then introduce them to a medical professional. So no, you do not have to immediately affirm anything. Um, neither do you have to deny anything either and probably of on the fly diagnosis in your mind of the person who's talking to you is probably not appropriate regardless. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Oh, all right. Um, my brain wants to say, well, what happens if I read everything on the internet so I know, no, that's a bad joke, sorry. Um, here's, the reality is that everybody talks about what's happening in schools without actually being in schools. Yeah. I'm a high school teacher. So we've had this discussion in my, I'm in Knox County. Okay. So we've had this discussion about pronoun and what you want to call a student if they want to call this. Honestly, the, especially what you want to call a student, I guess more of that idea of the person being in front of you. Mm -hmm. I mean, we live in the South where every other student wants to be called by their middle name. So it's, sorry about that. But anyway, uh, the reality is, is if they want to, if they're Mary and they want to be called Billy, I'm going to call them Billy because I think that's kind well, of disrespectful it, to them. Sure. And it detracts it, from your job, which is not to be concerned with these things. Right. And so right. I think that there's an easy way to get mixed up in a lot of this stuff sure. that it doesn't, I'm not saying you don't stand up for what you believe in, oh. but I think that people are ready to fight just like people on the other side are ready to fight when there should be some love. Right, keep the fight on the government level. There's a difference between you choosing of right. your own accord to use the term Billy instead of Jenny. Right. And an administrator coming in and saying, you're required to use the name Billy instead of Jenny. Totally different. It's keep true. the fight on the government level. Why do we have people coming in informing us about how our speech is supposed to be processed? Never once has that occurred in the history of English common law. Cut that nonsense out immediately. Absolutely fight all the way. Call ADF, Alliance for Defending Freedom. Tell them I sent you. No problem. <laughs> totally different than when somebody's standing in front of you saying, I'd like to be called Billy instead of Jenny. Totally different. Well, true. And as a social studies teacher, we have all this conversation about race and all that stuff. And mm -hmm. I talk about it in my class, and I say that we have to talk about it or we're going to go down the same roads and have those same horrible decisions made that we need to, love, to talk about it so we can love each other. Yeah. And so then if somebody is struggling with that, they're going to come to somebody that they feel loved by as opposed to somebody that has put up a wall and said you're wrong. That's right. You know, because one of the other options for you specifically is to point out to all of the people wanting all of these nuanced, you know, formats and mm -hmm. pronouns and all that stuff, and they want to wear different things and they want to look different ways, to be like, look, I don't want to deal with any of this. It's way too complicated. I have enough on my plate as a teacher. We're just going to go to a dress code and watch all of the young people panic. There's been that Because that can too. be arranged. Yeah. Yeah, that has been discussed as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Especially these guys that are pro-communism. I love pointing out, have you seen communist schools? Do you know how much easier that would be? Do you know who, what, who don't care about your pronouns? <laughs> yes. We can go there if you need to. True. All right, well, thank you. You're welcome. Hey, Josh. Okay, so I think I have a bit of a tough question as well. Okay. Um, so I heard your point about criticizing Christians who don't treat people with the kind of love that we ought to treat people because they identify as transgender. And I think that criticism is well-placed. But my question is, to what extent does the church have to guard itself from the corruption by these ideologies so that they don't fall apart in the way the Methodists have? Or like at UT, we have at least two campus ministries with their own buildings right. that fly trans and LGBTQ flags. Right. So... I guess, to what extent is there, is keeping trans or uh, LGBTQ people at arm's length from Christian groups an attempt to preserve the theologically sound nature of the church? And it, where do you draw the line between those two things? Yeah, good. This is going to sound terrible, but it's just this. And I don't mean this as a pat answer at all. There are lines in here, distinctions, definitions. There are also things that we're free 
to be, to follow our conscience on. Um, but in the case of the, the specific, specific things that you're bringing up, how do we not keep them at arm's length while still protecting like biblical orthodoxy, for example? The best I can say is we don't keep anybody at arm's length. We teach what this says, and if they want to keep us at arm's length, that's, they're right. But we never go, hey, you're not abiding by our theological preferences, you can't come to the Bible study. Rather, we say, this is what the scriptures teach. Would you like to come to the Bible study? And if they don't want to go, then that's their right. But this whole, like, you have to, you have to already pre-affirm secondary and tertiary ther theological issues like what we're dealing with on campus right now before you're allowed in the door, I think that's, I think that's odd. Make the teachers have the standard. The students can be whatever they want. If they're coming to the Bible study, great. Does that help you at all? I think your analogy with the Bible study helps, but I guess what I'm trying to say is you have a group of new believers being okay. led by a teacher mm -hmm. and say some critical mass of them are LGBTQ plus mm -hmm. whatever mm -hmm. else, and they sort of guide the Bible study in a way that the teacher disagrees with mm -hmm. and corrupt the other members of the Bible study who came to hear the word. Like, oh, okay. Does this Ask issue... Them. Just ask them. Yeah, I, I would go apologetic with it. And obviously, you're hearing a lot of Anna right now. This is my preference. Um, I would go to the individuals who are new Christians and say, hold up, we're teaching a new Christian Bible study. That means the primary orthodox issues are what are being discussed. The Trinity, hypostatic union, resurrection of Christ, absolutely having nothing to do with human sexuality. Could you guys cool it and save that for your own Bible studies later? We've got things to focus on. Then if there's an issue of, well, can we just deal with human sexuality? Well, now you've been invited, and now you can do a study on that if you need to and have the young people see that there are distinctions, but it was an invited thing. We don't let people just come in and wreck the course of a Bible study, and we, certain wouldn't, we, we certainly wouldn't run into an immediately controversial topic with brand new Christians unless you're me. <laughs> right, but I signed up for it, right? And you see that, you see that with Russia Christie. There's a format for that. There's an invitation. Hey, this is apologetics. Come, this is what's set up this way. But in a Bible study framework, you're studying the Bible. You're studying, what are you studying? Is it Ezekiel? Because an expository teaching on Ezekiel, you're not gonna touch secondary sexual preferences at all. So where, like, where are you in the scriptures? If, if sexuality needs to come up, fine. Do you see what I mean? Like there's, I, got, I need more detail as to what's going on before I can advise how to move further. Because the, the ministries that you're referencing on campus are not doing any protecting at all. And if you go to the Bible study, you will notice that there's no Bible to study because I've been to them. Do you see what I mean? Okay, thank you. Okay. Well, as a minister and past college professor and so forth, I'm all up for the fight. <laughs> and in fact, this is, you know, this whole sexuality issue has been an interest to me because I grew up in the Atlanta metro area. And back in the 80s, that was, homosexuality was becoming the thing. And what we have seen happen, in my opinion, over the course of time was you got the same kind of social contagion threats about suicide, about disassociation, uh, if you don't accept me as a homosexual family member, then I'm going to kill myself. I'm going to break bonds. I'm going to leave the church. I'm going to get away from the family. Those kinds of things. And all it's, that has happened in my estimation over the course of time is that those emotional ties that were so strong and so effective in the 80s and 90s in arguing the homosexuality stuff have been moved on down the line to the point that we get to the transgenderism issue that we have today and the same kinds of issues are being raised. You accept what I want or else I'm going to do X, one thing or the other. And, um, you know, that's, that's one of the things that I would like for us to recognize and to try to disassociate ourselves from, you know. The scriptures are very strong about talking about sacrificing whatever it takes, gouging your eye out kind of stuff, you know, whatever it takes to avoid hell is what 
we're supposed to be able, we're supposed to do. And if that costs you relationships with friends and family, so be it. You know, those are the things that have to happen. So the church, from a church perspective, and what I've seen and observed in my ministry years in the church, has been that the congregation softens and the leadership is dependent upon the congr congregation's money. And so the, con the leadership softens and they say, well, we, you know, we're not going to take any hard stances on these controversial topics. We don't want to have to deal with them. We don't want to have to face these issues because if we do, we're going to lose people. And if we lose people, well, we might lose our job or we might have to start cutting missions or we might have to give up our church building. All kinds of these things go in here. And so I understand what Anna was saying. I've, I'd noticed your weight problem before. I never addressed it because, number one, I didn't know it was a sin. Number two, lots of people have health and medical issues out there. Being overweight does not necessarily mean that there's a sin there you go. In, involved. There you go, but Dennis. when you come into a church, usually churches have are, are fairly homogeneous. We have certain standards and certain forms that we typically address. And if you come into a situation and you're radically different from that, then you're inviting problems in the first place. So we need to recognize that it's not all the church's fault. People do have reactions to things that are radically different from what they're expecting. If I brought a skunk in here, you would say, oh gosh, I wasn't expecting that, I wanna get out of here, right? Some people have these kinds of visceral reactions to homosexuality to transgenderism and, and other forms of dress and stuff. So that's not necessarily to say it's right, but Good that's job, also Darius. to say- I'm glad that I got somebody. <laughs> that's also not to say that we should let it bend us emotionally and say, oh, the church is so bad, the church is so awful that we just need to allow anybody to do anything that they want to. Because that's what you wind up with the guy before me here about the denominational problems with the Methodist church and others is they let people get in power who hold these progressive, so-called progressive views that are not biblically sound. Darius, and if you don't stand up for it, then... Do you have a question? Oh. I, lo I love you, brother, but you're my social media person and I'm allowed to poke you because I know you well okay, enough. Well, do you have a question? I had one when I first got up here <laughs> 30 minutes ago. Um, Look, I'm I'm the, proud I'm proud of you because I knew some, somebody out there is going to be like, Look, hold on a second, yeah. and that's I'm thank well, you and I'm proud of you for that. Well, I'm wanting I, I'm wanting to see some of these things. I wanted to see just a little bit more said about the topic of what does the Bible actually approve about sexuality? And just was, sexuality in general? Well, yes. Just you know, I sort of wanted to see it all come together. And okay, talk I'm writing about, it down. And just talk about what is the you know, what, what does the Bible actually prove? We often talk about what we don't approve. Yeah. And that's important for the doctrinal I issues. Understand. I understand. You stand there and you, you say, this is what the church teaches. Yeah. And you, we have to stand on that. I had, can, to be, I had to be really, really concise because I had to make certain yeah. that the church that hosts me wants to continue to do so. Okay. So I had to keep it down to an hour. Well, all I was really wanting to hear at the end was sort of, you know, what the Bible approves of is, You're up next. is sexuality within the confines okay. of marriage. And, you know, we need to learn how to recognize that, how to teach it, and how to uphold it. And people who are wavering on this and have these emotional problems that we're dealing with, with all other the pulls from society, we need to figure out how to teach them to conform to what the scripture says and not have the church conform totally. to what the world says. Thank you, Darius. Go ahead. You may have already answered this to some degree, but thinking about the power of prayer as believers, um, and you know, one of the things that we can offer people in love is to pray for them. However, I know this is a complicated transitional process that people go through when they experience gender dysphoria. Um, what do you think about offering to pray for people experiencing gender dysphoria, and does that matter uh, based on where they are in the process from in the transition, does that make sense? Like, did they come to you and ask for prayer, or yeah. are you just showing up going, you look strange, you need prayer? Well, you, <laughs> when you have someone in your congregation, which I have had, mm -hmm. and you have people that say, well, we need to pray for them. You know, we need to pray that God would you know, remove that dysphoria, that God would restore them to the gender in which he uh, originally intended. You know, and, and like I, somebody in the group actually knows that the person has gender dysphoria and has 
is, is dealing oh, yeah. with that specifically. Oh, yeah. And yeah. it's not like a gossip, like, Correct. okay, good. Yeah. Um, is there anything wrong with praying for people? No. Yeah. Absolutely nothing. Just, you know, please don't, don't point people out and be like, mm, you're extra strange, you're getting prayer first. <laughs> like, wait for them to ask for it. Okay. Yes. So I know that you kind of know more about my situation, uh -huh. but um, for those of you that don't, I do have a younger sibling. She is 18 and has been playing with her identity, I guess is a great way to describe it. Doesn't necessarily know how she identifies. Natural born female, I guess is the best way to preface it. Um, with this being a personal matter, and I'm a very, you know, I'm a very logical individual, but mm -hmm. I do get caught up in my emotions sometimes. Mm -hmm. How do, um, I approach my very conservative family about, hey, you're being too harsh, and then also approaching my younger sibling without, I guess, I don't know how to phrase it. I guess, conforming to whatever she's wanting me to conform to without like uh, putting my faith on a back burner. Yes. And without putting my integrity on a back burner as well. Right, right. You pray a lot, and then you just be you because the Lord designed specifically you and he put you in that framework. You didn't pick your family, which means there are design features that are specific to you that speak volumes in ways that I never would be able to with all of my talks and books and laptop and Diet Coke and microphones, okay? So don't, don't miss that, that really matters. In my experience, full transparency is the best way to move forward. Hey, sister, I love you to pieces, and there's nothing you could ever do to the point that you, I wouldn't consider you my sister and love you. If you ever want to talk to me about this, I'm grieving, and I really don't know how to proceed because there are a bunch of things that I don't want to offend you. I don't want to make our relationship worse. I don't even know if you're offended by the fact that I'm a Rasha Christie student in general. I just want you to know that I love you to pieces and I don't, want, I don't want any of the dumpster fire that I see out there to come between you and I. How would you like me to proceed? Yeah, and I guess, yeah, the other part of that being very hyper conservative father, not mm -hmm. saying that that's necessarily a bad thing, mm -hmm. but have a hyper conservative father, indifferent mother, neither one of them are, I guess, any form of religious. They claim something, but they don't practice. So in terms of addressing them and not harshly addressing my sister, mm -hmm. but then also making sure that they also feel heard, but then also addressing all the media stuff with everything else going on, it's Rem been very interesting. Remind yourself constantly that you cannot control other people. True. Yeah, because they, they have to sleep in their own heads with their consciences at 3 a.m., and you're not there. So there's an element there. Um, this is something that's come up recently a lot that ended up speaking more volumes than I ever intended, but it was something that I said in passing that I learned when I was a kid with a group of adults who had children who were dealing with this and they were freaking out. I mean, they were just absolutely, they were just going nuts. They were listening to all of the podcasts that were all in a very specific area, right? And they did not everything, they were, they were having conversations, but really what they were doing was they were screaming at the podcast people, they weren't talking to their kid anymore, that kind of stuff. Because it's a panic response, they love their kids, right? But the thing that got the, the perspective of getting the panic response to be alleviated was a completely different frame of reference. And all that I ended up saying was, please do not forget that your children are the ones who are going to choose your nursing home. <laughs> and I have never seen more people get uncomfortable in my life. And it was, it was just, that was just a phrase that was brought, when I was growing up, that was a phrase all the time. I didn't know it wasn't a phrase in the Bible Belt. I didn't know. But it worked, because all of a sudden it was like, the podcasts were gone, and now I'm talking to my baby again. And there's a long-term consequence for the way that I, I speak and how I perform here, right? And all of a sudden, it's okay to just be mom and dad again. I hope that's what happened. I think that's what happened. I don't know if that's good. But yeah, just cold water perspective change when you're dealing with a really, like, super exposed nerve taboo subject in a culture. You want to try to flip the perspective out of whatever they've been recently hearing. Okay. That's, that's my little tidbit of 
psychology for you. So it's, maybe it'll be helpful, maybe it won't. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yes, ma'am? Okay, Anna. How do you keep from saying, well, you would not say it, but um, God doesn't make mistakes. He made you a girl, you're a girl. Mm -hmm. He made you a boy, you're a boy. Mm -hmm. How do you, how do you say okay? Well, if you, to somebody that doesn't think a, they're a girl or a boy, mm -hmm. you know what I'm trying to say? Yes, I totally do. When God made them male and female, yeah, right. That's yeah. Genesis one. So that should be the. Mm -hmm. Then how he made. Do you keep from saying that's the argument. God God made you a girl. God made you a boy. That's what you're supposed to be. Now, why are you thinking that you're something else? Right. The, the thing that it fails to keep into mind, in, into, in mind is the result of the fall and that all of creation falls along with Adam when he eats the apple, which means there are parts of our body that are not directly designed for the purpose of the original design of male and female. We've got brokenness now. We have sin and it's affecting our very biology, which means anomalous... Um, development is possible and it happens all the time. Whether or not this kid has that, I have no idea. But the, f the idea that it could occur is genuinely real and does happen. So keeping in mind the brokenness factor and in mind that the design framework in sin is providential. Not that God causes brokenness, but that God writes straight with crooked lines. Right? There are consequences to our fall. That's one of them, and he is now going to use it for his glory. That's where you, your, your design matters. You're a feature, not a flaw, even in your brokenness. But it's still anomalous. It's not the original design. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Any questions in the back? No questions from my producer? Okay. That's it, y'all. You made it. I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you. Um, go in peace. Serve the Lord. Be safe driving home. <laughs>